Our next speaker is trial lawyer Johnny Johnson, a founding partner of Lightfoot Franklin and White in Birmingham, Alabama. Johnny is widely recognized as one of the best and most experienced trial lawyers in the South for his handling of environmental and toxic tort litigation. The Best Lawyers of America publication recognized him for commercial and environmental litigation as well as for Bet the Company cases. Johnny's clients have brought him complex mass, mass tort litigation, class actions, pesticide and chemical litigation, and individual toxic tort claims throughout the Southeast. He is also a pioneer in developing systems for efficient management of complex litigation, which he'll talk about today. On the pro bono side, Johnny is president of the Norma Livingston Ovarian Cancer Foundation, which raises money to support research in that area and promote awareness of the disease. Here's Johnny. Good morning, everybody. It is good to be here. It's always fun to be here. Uh, Ed and Ellis always do a great job. I was telling my wife as we were going down to dinner last night, you're going to see a bunch of people who are very charming, very likable, and have huge egos. <laughs> and she said, that's okay. It sounds exactly like going to a party at your firm. I'll be fine. <laughs> the uh, presentations this morning have been great. Uh, as always happens, facts come up that uh, inspire me to impart additional knowledge. Two things came up this morning that I think are important for you to know. <clears throat> One, that wonderful scene from My Cousin Vinny, which I think is the greatest courtroom scene ever filmed, was filmed in the courthouse in Monroeville, Alabama, and which is the hometown, by the way, of Truman Capote, and Harper Lee, uh, Harper Lee wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, which is probably the greatest courtroom book ever written, or at least I think it is. And the other thing that came up that I thought I ought to share uh, from the unfortunate hurricane in uh, the Northeast, but the great picture of Chris Christie, and I want to let you guys know that I have been cast to play Chris Christie. <laughs> in the upcoming mini-series about the hurricane. Now these, Ed, what do you do? Push the green button if you wanted to, okay. As I said, these things are always fun. I've had great fun with <laughs> presentations in the past. We did one about overcoming obstacles in cases. Did that out in the desert, it was fun. I want to warn all of you, this sort of thing is dangerous. This is okay for kung fu guys like me and John, who were just up here, but the rest of you should be very cautious in trying this sort of thing. We did one about how you prepare yourself intellectually and the library time you have to log to handle big cases. That's my partner, Lee Hollis, and all of you know him. That's the only time he's ever been in our library. <laughs> We had one about what to do when things go wrong in depositions, and that's a subject that's near and dear to all of us, because no matter how much you prepare a witness, something goes wrong every time. And then my favorite one is what to do after you've won a big case. And, you know, this was a very complicated presentation. I don't have time. <laughs> to do all that this morning, but I'm in a room full of trial lawyers, and I want to poll the audience. What is the single most important thing to do after you won a big case? Does anybody know the answer? I'm disappointed. The answer is make sure everybody knows it. <laughs> but this morning we've got a serious subject to talk about. And I'm, I'm giving a, what I call a toolbox uh, talk this morning where I'm really talking to all of you about uh, evaluating cases, big cases that come in, whether it's a securities case. Uh, most of the work I do is in mass tort litigation. 
But any kind, this applies to any kind of case where there are a lot of moving parts and a lot of parties to keep organized and keeping the case organized and moving forward efficiently. So what I've done is assemble a group of lists to share with you. They're in the little handout that's on everybody's desk this morning. And I just want to run through them. When a big case comes in, what do you do? Obviously, the first thing you've got to do is assess what you've got and what the risks are likely to be and who needs to respond to it. Uh, the, the listing that's in the book is actually the one I use. It's a little easier to read than this version. Uh, but all of the things on this list are obviously important. Finding out what happened is important. I took tort law from a great old gentleman named John Wade, who was a survivor of the Bataan Death March and a sure enough no-nonsense guy. He was also the author of, or one of the authors, of Prosser, Wade, and Schwartz, which a lot of us, a lot of us old guys, used when we were in law school. And he used to say, you know, quit worrying so much about legal theory, figure out first who did something wrong, and then the rest of it will fall into place as you're evaluating what to do with the case. Uh, for me, and, you know, I'm talking to a bunch of experts on doing this, but in my part of the world, if I've got a case in Huntsville, Alabama, where NASA is, or I've got a case in Wilcox County, Alabama, where nothing but poverty is, I evaluate them very differently. And my favorite war story on learning the venue and figuring out where you are, I was doing wood treating litigation for a company called Kerr McGee Chemical. And I did their cases all over the South. Uh, somebody else did them in the North. And they had a problem with a case in Avoca, Pennsylvania. And they sent me up there to look at the case and evaluate what to do with it. And I always want to put my feet on the ground and walk around and see what's going on. And I got the plant manager to go around town with me, set up a meeting with uh, a city councilman, we actually went, saw, ran into the sheriff at the courthouse. And <clears throat> those of you, uh, may, or many of you may remember the, the national no notoriety that this courthouse got because when I left that meeting, I called the client and said, what these people do for dirty politics is not the same thing as dirty politics in Alabama. Dirty politics in Alabama is child's play compared to what these people do. And I got them to let me interview lawyers. And I found a great lawyer who's been a great friend over the years named Sal Cognetti, who was one of the three lawyers on their judicial oversight committee. And this is the courthouse where two of the judges and one lawyer who, is, as it happens, was the lawyer that was on the other side of my case, went to prison for sentencing kids to a juvenile detention facility. That happened two or three years ago, and you guys may, may remember the case. But the most important thing to me on this list, <clears throat> other than evaluating the facts, is knowing where you are. In any case that's got uh, issues that might reach outside the courthouse, You've got to make sure you've got the right people involved. You know, one of the most frustrating things to a trial lawyer is working on a case that's in the newspapers and finding out that the client is not coordinating things with you. And uh, many clients nowadays hire public relations firms. And in general, I have found working with them to be informative and helpful but they've got to keep you in the loop. So if you've got a series of cases, and uh, Philip, didn't your firm do BP in Mississippi? Mine did it in Alabama. The claims process is going to be a big part of it. 
Regulatory issues are gonna be a big part of it. And in general, the press is gonna be a big part of it. So you have to organize this early and make sure that communications at least pass by you if they're not passing through you. And the one thing I would encourage everybody to do is be involved in developing the settlement strategy in the claims process and insist if people are gonna give statements to regulators and the press that you get to spend some time talking to them about issues in the case before that happens. And in my experience, companies are very sophisticated about making sure potential witnesses talk to their lawyers before they talk to the press. But I've had many occasions in the past where they're off doing things with the regulators that I know nothing about that can have tremendous impact on litigation. And I always ask them to let me prepare a witness like that as if I were preparing them for a deposition before they go do those interviews and before they get involved in talking to regulators. The rest of the stuff along the bottom is pretty obvious, pretty standard, uh, but also important in all of our cases, or at least uh, mass cases. A client actually sent me this chart because when they've got high exposure cases, obviously their reporting obligations trigger legal responsibilities for them. They're important. And the client that sent me this chart sent it to me and said, you managed to screw this up every single time. Please put this chart on your desk. And it's really very useful, and I, I actually have sent this chart around my firm because all of us think we know what reporting obligations are, but we put language in our letters very many times that's not only not necessary, but not helpful. And the language to know from this chart I always fix these little note cards for myself and then I never look at them until I forget something. <laughs> so I'm gonna look at this one to make sure I don't mess it up here. The language, the important language from this chart is that before they are obligated to report something, a uh, liability or loss must be probable and it must be estimable. So a lot of us can tell them if we've got a case in Wilcox County, Alabama, or Avoca, Pennsylvania, this is not a defendant-friendly forum. And the odds of coming out with a successful outcome, at least at the trial level in this kind of forum, are not very good. But in, in the case, certainly those Pennsylvania cases, the merits of the claims, most of them were personal injury, there were some property claims, were not very strong. They were weak, weak uh, causation cases as a lot of those cases usually are. And there was no way to predict what those claims might actually be worth. So under the rules and in the little handout, I've given you the citations to the reporting rules that you're supposed to follow. But in this day and time when all of our clients have reporting obligations that they have to be very careful with, we have to be very careful what we tell them. I am a big advocate, as is obvious from those forms, of evaluating a case early if it's a case that you don't think you're gonna get a good outcome with, you need to try to get it resolved early because at least in my world, cases never seem to get better with age, at least for a defendant. But how you report that to your client is something you have to be extremely sensitive to. And I would caution everybody to follow the rule we give our own clients all the time, use the telephone. Once you write things down, 
and send it in to a client that might trigger some of these obligations, they are stuck with it. So make sure you've coordinated with their own risk people in-house and uh, that you're giving them accurate information and giving them your best judgment, but be very careful what you commit to writing. And actually the client that sent me this said you've got all this language in this report which is not really very helpful. You know, you say we might have a bad, bad outcome. I know that. Uh, you say it might cost us a lot of money. I know that. But none of that helps me in evaluating my obligation here. And of course, I didn't tell him, well, one of my associates filled that form out. And I, I didn't tell him that for two reasons. One, it would have been bad form. And two, I really wouldn't have done much better, <laughs> frankly. But I keep this on my desk all the time now when I'm filling out uh, auditor letter reports. The other thing that is certainly the reality today that was not the reality when a lot of us started practicing law a few decades ago is that you have to be able to predict costs for clients, and you have to be able to manage costs for clients. Now, I'm sure all of us have systems. Uh, I actually gave a presentation about this system at a network meeting years ago. It was, it may have been the dullest presentation I've ever heard, much less the dullest I've ever given, so I'm not going to repeat it here. But the frustration for lawyers is there really aren't good software products on the market to help you do this. Uh, we did this by building a template uh, in a software called Microsoft Project, which is an engineering software. It is really powerful, uh, gives the client great visibility, and is almost impossible for the legal mind to use correctly. I have a guy in my office who is the biggest gearhead you have ever seen in your life, and we may fire everybody else in the office, but as long as he's around, I'm around, he's going to be around because he understands this and can do them, and uh, it generates you know, very detailed information, which in addition to helping the client budget, helps you and the client have discussions about, we, let's not do this. You know, half of the money in this budget might be directed toward some particular kind of discovery that's really not going to drive the settlement decision and really not going to drive the liability decision at trial. So it's a very useful tool in uh, helping them decide what work to do and what work to wait for. And as you can see, whoops, in the, uh, I'd forgotten it wasn't on this slide presentation, but in the handout materials, there are some reporting forms that we use to track these things. I will tell all of you this, having used this very complicated piece of software for over a decade, I am absolutely convinced that if you sit down and just map out the work in a case, all the lawyers in this room have got enough experience to say, that piece of work ought to take this many hours. That This kind of case, I'm going to have to devote one paralegal full time and maybe one associate 70% of the time to work on it. And maybe it's going to take 15% of my time. I've gotten so tired of fooling with that piece of software that unless the client makes me, I eyeball it and send them a spreadsheet on Microsoft Excel, and I think for experienced lawyers, in general, that probably works just as well. If you've got clients that require that level of detail, uh, you know, there are materials out there that will allow you to give that to them. Uh, but not only doing budgets, but meeting budgets uh, is an important part of what we do today. It's probably as important or nearly as important as helping clients manage risk in this economy. 
and Ed's got this thing up here showing zero. So I'd better sit down, but it's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to having cocktails with all of you tonight, and thank you very much. <laughs>